All right, we got people coming in. Hi, everyone. We're going to give just a few minutes. We have a, a large group today, so we're going to wait a little bit. Can I hear my background noise? <laughs> Hi, Ryan. All right, room is getting, we got almost a hundred people already. So yeah, and it's 12 o'clock. So we'll wait maybe two more minutes. Hi, everyone. You have some messages spam on the chat. <laughs> so. Yes, uh, I was going to mention that someone is asking about the certificates. I was going to mention that definitely next week you will receive part one and part two certificates. Um, we're in the middle of a lot of uh, events going on at the chapter. So we weren't able to print them last week, but for next week, you'll have both of them. It's in our list. <laughs> We're hosting our design awards next week. So that's another huge event that we're in the middle of planning. We got 110 uh, submissions this year. So it's it's pretty good. All right, we have 120 something and going up still. So I, I'm just gonna start the event. I'm, I know more people are gonna join later, but they'll just catch up. So hi everyone. Welcome to our second, uh, second uh, series of a third series webinar. I'm Graciela Carrillo, president of the American Institute of Architects Long Island chapter. I'm very happy to collaborate with NASA BOCES on putting together this important event for educators, architects, engineers, and everyone that is involved in the planning and design of schools. Before I introduce you to the program, let me go through a few housekeeping items. Uh, of course, this is again, part two of a three series. You don't need to register for part three. If you already did for this one, uh, you will receive a Zoom link two or one days before uh, the next seminar, which is in two weeks from today. Uh, just please take note that 
Uh, the third webinar is at 10 in the morning, not at noon as usual, because we're going to have a speaker from Japan and Germany. For continuing education credits for architects, you will need to be logged in the entire session in order to receive your credits. Um, like I said before, if you are an AIA member, uh, we will record the credits for you. If you're not an AIA member, we will send you the certificate uh, by next week from part one and part two, and then eventually for part three, if you're joining. Now, let me introduce you to Anthony Fierro, AIA Executive Director at NASA BOSIS. Uh, thank you, Graciela. Uh, hello again, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the second installment of our School Planning and Design three-part webinar series. Uh, my name is Anthony Fierro. I am the Executive Director of Facility Services for NASA BOCES. And uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, BOCES stands for the Board of Cooperative, Cooperative Educational Services. And we're an educational agency located on Long Island. Uh, in New York, and we provide shared educational programs and services to the 56 school districts here in, uh, in Nassau County. So this three-part webinar is hosted by Nassau BOCES and the Long Island chapter of the American Institute of Architects in collaboration with AIA New York State. Uh, the series is titled Reinventing the School Learning Environment, Case Studies from Around the World. Uh, we're featuring case studies of innovative school design projects presented by leading national and international architectural firms. And today we're very excited to have two prominent firms from the US presenting from Colorado and Washington DC. So we're gonna continue examining the challenges we face in school design today and discuss new educational models and, uh, and concepts that, uh, that will hopefully impact school design for generations to come. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. R.G. France, our Associate Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Educational Services here at NASA BOCES to uh, share her thoughts. So, Dr. France. Thank you, Tony. One of my major roles as the Associate Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Educational Services at NASA BOCES is to ensure all instructional programs are providing challenging, caring and safe learning environments, which enable students of all ages and abilities to achieve their maximum potential. Creating engaging learning environment is a critical element in the teaching and learning process. Research has shown engaging learning environments increases students' attention and focus, promotes meaningful learning experiences, encourages higher levels of performance, and motivates students to practice higher level critical thinking skills. My fascination with educational spaces began at the early age of two years old. I was a PBS kid before Nickelodeon became a thing. Every day I woke up, ate breakfast, and got dressed to begin my learning adventure on the television. My lineup was Sesame Street, Electric Company, Mr. Rogers, and Zoom. I know I'm dating myself. Each show created unique and engaging learning environments with the use of colors, lighting, technology, sound, and furniture to inspire learning. I couldn't wait to go to school. I dreamed often of what my school and classroom would look like and what it would be. Finally, my first day of school arrived. I got up and did my normal routine, but this time my learning adventure was gonna occur at my school. As I walked towards the school with my mom holding my hand, I was shocked. The building was made of ugly brown bricks. There were no trees and no flowers. We entered the main lobby. It was huge. It had a large cardboard box, which stated in the corner, lost and found. And there was a long wooden bench sitting by a door that said principal. In my mind, this couldn't be good. I tried to walk out the door, but my mom tugged my hand and told me it was gonna be okay. And she walked me to my classroom. When I got there, I was flabbergasted. My classroom was a box. All the student desks were facing the large chalkboard and the teacher's desk was right next to it. The walls were covered with posters. In one corner, I saw a place where we could hang our coats. In another corner, I saw toys that we could play with. And in another corner, I saw a stack of cots. I believe it was when I saw the cots, I fell out crying. Why? I had found my classroom, but I felt totally lost and uninspired. School looked nothing like what I saw on TV, nor what I dreamed it to be. 
What I wanted as a child and what every child wants, regardless of their age, grade, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status and or disability is a challenging learning environment which ignites curiosity, fosters connection and collaboration, develops critical thinking, inspires creativity and nurtures civic readiness. I hope you all are curious and ready to learn about innovative 21st century school designs which empower students to pursue their passions with endless possibilities. Back to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Dr. France. Uh, now I'll turn it back over to Graciela to introduce today's speakers. Graciela. Thank you, Dr. France. Those were powerful uh, words. Uh, so we have our speakers today, uh, Pam Lofferman from FAA from DLR Group. She is a senior principal uh, that manages the K-12 sector. She is a passionate advocate for teaching and learning. Um, her career has been shaped by, by working predominantly with diverse clients in the educational and cultural sectors who sought to leverage architectural design excellence to shape outcomes that add value to people's life and promote a sustainable future. Her portfolio includes notable projects in both K-12 and higher education nationally and internationally. Pam has also been an active member and advocate for the architectural profession, where she has served as AIA National Vice President 2008-2010, Committee on Architecture for Education Advisory Group, and SCUP Regional Council member. Our second speaker is Sean O'Donnell, FAA Lead AP. He is also a principal at Perkins Eastman. Uh, Sean leads Perkins Perkins Eastman International K-12 Education Practice, advising and inspiring diverse project teams on new and best practices in design for learning environments. Sean understands how intrinsic learning is to the human experience. Through his work, he seeks to re revolutionize schools, transforming expectations of the role in educated future leaders. He sees the school as the center of its community and brings together civic architecture, sustainable design, and innovative educational planning to create high-performing, inspiring places where students learn and grow. Um, Sean also conducts innovative, innovative research and speaks out about transformative, sustainable learning environments around the world. After the presentations by our speakers, we will have some time for Q&A session. So please feel free to start sending your questions in the Q&A box or the chat. And then once they finish the presentation, uh, we will go through all the questions in the boxes. So now please welcome Pam. I'm gonna stop my video now and, and you can share your screen. Thank you, Pam. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, Dr. Franz, how aspirational your comments were. And it is exactly because of educators like you that I so enjoy what I do, um, because it really is um, each one of you all in terms of the educators, your aspirations for your school districts, for your school are really what uh, provide our North Star in terms of creating architecture that enables your vision. Um, as uh, Graciela said, DLR Group is a, a national international firm. Uh, we are data-driven, research-informed, and um, as I said, really connected to that North Star that is each client's um, vision. Um, Sean and I are really excited. We're both gonna present two built projects and two uh, works on the board. These are certainly exciting, but challenging times. I think that all of us have been faced uh, between the pandemic and other um, uh, incidents going on in the world uh, with really looking for those opportunities to really connect, if you will, that work-life life balance. There really are, I think, three um, elements that are really pushing that conversation, particularly at the high school level. This does not mean that there aren't similar conversations that really start percolating up, both in the elementary and the middle school. But 
our youth, our, our you know, alpha, beta, um, Z, whatever generation is coming up, are really pushing the envelope on what they see are important elements of their world. And workforce is pulling. Uh, certainly the conversation about work supply chain, about um, life balance being fulfilled is changing the vocabulary of our uh, youth for tomorrow. How do we make sure that learning uh, is both authentic and scalable? We all know that, um, you know that in order for outcomes to be the best they can, uh, that students and teachers, let's not forget the teachers, need to be truly engaged in the work they're doing and engaged and enabled by the environments that they're working within. How do we make sure that there are small learning communities that really enhance individual learning that really allow us to meet every student where they are? We have the power, we have the possibilities of engaging every student through technology enhanced programs um, and being able to track those stories that really make a difference. So my first example is of Canyon View High School that is just is in the West Valley uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. This project started, uh, it's planning uh, around 2015, and it really was about what is that teaching and learning continuum. It was a comprehensive, or it is a comprehensive high school for over 1800. Um, and in fact, they've been so successful that they're up to 2100 and we are actually building um, a fifth fort, which you'll hear about a little bit later, um, because the superintendent feels strongly that every student who wants to come to this school should be able to come. Um, so a lot of conversations about what is teaching and learning and how can we really find that resonance that allows all people to be engaged. You can see as part of our planning process, there were three um, major bold ideas, if you will. Um, Dr. Runyon, who was the superintendent at that time, really wanted this school to be a catalyst for change. He wanted to really focus on small learning communities, and he really wanted learning to be a marketplace where students could pick and choose uh, where and what they wanted to engage in. This is a pathway school, and so as the school opened, every student has to spend at least their first two years within a pathway. After two years, they are allowed to make a change if it's not the correct pathway. But uh, the idea that they will get certifications and they will dive deep enough to understand what career pathways entail it was an important conversation as part of planning this school. So everything from agribusiness to coding to sports medicine to arts and robotics were included within the overall curriculum. The other thing that was a large component of this conversation, which was in fact driven by state standards, uh, was because of the fact that funding flows through the score fee per student, uh, it actually really pushed us to enhance the wonderful environment in Arizona to create a 110,000 square foot agora, which is the outdoor learning space, which creates the spine through the middle of the school. The learn, small learning communities or forts are located on the north side of uh, the project and the public spaces are located on the south in order to provide secure 24 seven access. The other thing that is true is that all of the learning spaces are quite differentiated. Um, and I'm gonna show you a short video about all this because seeing the project three-dimensionally really helps to feel um, the uh, overall uh, variety of the space in place. The interesting thing is um, teachers and students actually rotate from classroom to classroom on a bi-monthly basis, because when you look at the teaching and learning that takes place, say for instance, in the upper left corner, that environment is completely different from the environment in the lower right corner. So um, planning and curriculum is really um, at the juncture of uh, teaching and learning and architecture that enables. So let's look at a quick video. As we look at the landscape of education today, we realize that it's changing. So we were very intentional about the work for college and career readiness. This campus models the opportunity for students that are preparing for both worlds. 
So whether you're gonna go straight into the workforce, whether you're going to go to college, this campus is designed to be supportive. I think Canyon View really represents an incredible precedence and benchmark for the country. It celebrates the individuality of each student, but without sacrificing any of the rigor that's really required for a high school education today. We've got a ton of diversity here at Canyon View High School. It's an interesting dichotomy between all of our students on campus, what they do, what they're involved in. We don't have any closed spaces. I tell our teachers all the time, if you're coming to a school where you can go into your classroom, close the door, teach for eight hours, and then leave, that's not gonna happen here. Our students and our teachers interact with each other so much because of the structure of the forts and the structure of the agora and the open spaces. You're gonna be around different people and you're gonna engage with them. This Agora is a wonderful space. We've got 100,000 square feet of space here. Through the design process, we uh, discovered a science called allesthesia. What we realized was it is important that we design a space that has different thermal environments. And we have several different spaces that show a variety of design features that achieve that comfort level of 85 degrees. It was really an opportunity to leverage space in a different way. Think about when you were a young child playing with your neighbors or your family. You wanted to build a fort. You grabbed some blankets, you grabbed some, some couch cushions and some pillows, and you made something in that moment. That's what we wanted this place to be. We wanted to be something in the moment. Awesome. So that is our first example. Uh, at about the same time that uh, Canyon View was under planning and design, uh, DLR Group uh, started working with Cherry Creek uh, uh, as part of the Denver, if you will, uh, community. Uh, in 2015, Colorado changed their overall graduation requirements, and Cherry Creek really embraced that conversation uh, in terms of really thinking about how they could incorporate Pathways of Passion with uh, the overall curriculum. So there were four big ideas in terms of a paradigm shift, innovation, soft skills, and uh, really how architecture can provide the spaces in between um, uh, learning spaces that really allow for those ca casual collisions that we all know are very important. Um, so the student experience was front and center in terms of that conversation of how they could interact. Also the iCommons became program space that was really uh, plan to allow for those different kinds of experiences, everything from TED Talks to small breakout spaces. The main level plan, which is where you, where you enter the building and you actually see and are engaged in the entire facility, uh, worked very hard on sight lines so that you could see all nine pathways that were part of this program. And so rather than spend a lot of time, once again, um, I'm going to go to a video to allow uh, the superintendent and principal to talk a little bit more about these programs in a building that they purposely wanted to look different from and to engage people from the highway. Welcome to the future of excellence here at the Cherry Creek Innovation Campus. This beautiful campus represents the culmination of a vision of our district, one that seeks to connect every one of our students with their own pathway of purpose. In Cherry Creek Schools, we are spearheading a change in the narrative of what effective post-secondary planning should look like now and in the future. The CCIC will serve the Cherry Creek Schools community as a next level college and career preparedness facility focused on meeting the needs of students who are not only college bound, but for students who will be entering the workforce or military upon graduation from their home high schools. This amazing campus will serve as a capstone to the innovation spaces that have been added to every elementary and middle school across our district. The CCIC is the result of the entire Cherry Creek School District system working together 
across all grade levels. When I first got the job uh, and I was first notified that, wow, I get to be the principal of the CCIC, we didn't have any land. We didn't know what we were going to teach in the place. We didn't know what kind of pathways were going to be offered. And then to physically be able to stand in the place that this community has been talking about and planning for so long, uh, it's just a dream. It's such a wonderful place. And, and to walk through each one of the pathways, seeing how much business and industry has helped design each one of those areas, not just equipment, but uh, curriculum and culture and climate and bringing in guest lecturers and donations. Uh, it's just phenomenal. It's just, it's wonderful to walk through this place, see the amazing opportunities that we're really going to be ready to offer our kids. This 117,000 square foot campus is the gateway to the trades of the future for our students. Most importantly, the CCIC is the bridge to their dreams, their purpose, and their future successes. The future of education is here, and thanks in part to the CCIC, it is an everyday reality for our students in the Cherry Creek School District. We're very excited to offer seven different pathways to our kids at the CCIC. We've got an advanced manufacturing pathway, we've got a business services pathway, we've got a health and wellness pathway, we've got a hospitality and tourism pathway, infrastructure engineering, IT and STEAM, and lastly, we've got transportation, and in transportation, that pathway, we've got two programs. We've got an automotive tech program and an aviation maintenance tech program. Uh, a year ago, we were hoping 800 students might show up. Well, we had over 1,500 applications, and we have about 1,100 kids that are going to be starting school with us come this August, and that's pretty incredible. At the CCIC, we've got kids coming here who've got a 4.2 GPA, and I got kids coming here with a 1.2 GPA, and I love that because it's really about that individual student. It's about students that are college bound and not college bound. It's truly for everyone. Welcome to the Cherry Creek Innovation Campus, the future of innovation in the Cherry Creek Schools. So with that, I am going to hand it over and to Sean uh, so that we have time for lots and lots of questions. Um, certainly uh, the last year or so is, uh, or the, actually the last couple of months, as students return for the most part to their campuses, uh, there's a lot of interesting conversations about how these two schools in particular are um, moving forward. Great, thanks Pam. That's really exciting work and very exciting to see. Uh, I think you'll find lots of commonalities probably through the conversation uh, today. But uh, thanks to NASA BOCES and AIA Long Island for inviting me. Uh, I'm a child of Long Island. I grew up in Nassau County. My educational experience was much like Dr. Francis though, uh, both on the, the TV screen and in my reaction to the educational environments. So one of the things, you know, I think we'll see is that you know we're not designing you know those facilities, those buildings, those environments the way that uh, we were raised in many ways. Uh, we're looking very much ahead. But what I want to do today is. Uh, of course, I'll talk about a couple of buildings, but I want to actually talk more about a district. And this is my second home, actually. So you can imagine I'm going to talk about the District of Columbia. Many of you probably have uh, a perception of the District of Columbia. It might be as a sort of hotbed of you know dysfunction and uh, disarray in our governmental system. But what I want you to do is come away with uh, actually a very different perception of our city here one of a city that's really committed to elevating the student experience, elevating the, the quality of our communities, addressing all the issues that have arisen through the pandemic of certainly uh, public health, but uh, economic injustice, uh, racial inequality, climate change. And the city in many ways is very forward thinking about each of these issues. And of course, one of the biggest levers that uh, any city or jurisdiction has to address those issues on a comprehensive scale is, is their schools. So DC has uh, about 50,000 students in about 117 schools across each of the eight wards of the city. And there's about a comparable number of students in public charter schools as well, also you know, reasonably well distributed across the city as well. But one of the things that was just celebrated was that DC, uh, of all urban jurisdictions, uh, actually just was honored for greater student achievement gains than most any other jurisdiction across the country. And so that's, of course, you know, uh, 
you know, a celebration of the hard work of DCPS and the educators, but there's also something that's concurrent with that achievement that's happened over the past 25 years. And when I came to the district uh, back in 2000, um, walking into a school building was risky. They, they were falling apart literally around your ears. They were you know, dangerous to the students. They were dangerous to teachers. One teacher, in fact, said to me, you know, it snows in my classroom. And then when I looked stunned at him, he said, seriously. Um, so that tragic state of affairs has been something that we've been addressing over the last 20, 22 years here with a $4 billion reinvestment in the school facilities over time. And you can see the, you know, a couple of examples here and the generations of buildings that we're dealing with. And many of them are existing facilities. But while the district is rebuilding, uh, you know, and building more contemporary learning environments, as we'll see in a moment, the other commitments that they've made to the community too, and to again address these larger overarching issues we're addressing is one of sustainable design and high performance. So of course, where we are required to uh, comply with LEED up to a gold standard, that's a minimum threshold here. Um, but you can also see that as we move through the modernization program, um, the, the bar kept on getting higher as we achieved greater and greater gains and returns. So two net zero schools that I'll share with you in a moment are uh, hot off the presses and just open in a few weeks at this point. But the other thing the district did, which underpins a lot of the architecture that we're doing and you know kudos to them that they made this commitment prior to the pandemic that public health um, was uh, a primary driver in the design of their learning environments. So um, well certification is now a standard here in the district. Um, the first project I'll show you is the first project to uh, target both net zero and well. Um, but again, you know, the health and well-being and thinking comprehensively about the whole child uh, in the environment and even outside of the school environment is critical to the schools that we're delivering here now. This is Dunbar Senior High School. It was uh, opened in 2014. Um, because of these aspirations in the district um, and the, the drive to really create this great high performance learning environment, you can see that um, it ultimately became the highest scoring lead for schools project in the world. That was by no way a goal, but it was just a circumstance resulting from the, these goals that DCPS had put forward. Um, and in fact, one council member, you know, recognizing that this had happened, challenged the idea that, you know, can we afford to build such schools like this? And the answer started to show up uh, uh, as we moved into the academic year. So the school started returning the highest test score gains of any high school in the uh, city, uh, the greatest enrollment gains, greater graduation rates. So these indicators started to suggest that there's a connection between the top and the bottom. And in many ways, you know, we had to rise though to the challenge raised by that council member to start to demonstrate that it was truly a connection to the architecture. So we sought some funding from J&J &J Flooring um, and we started a study on nine schools, both modernized and mo unmodernized with a research team. And so you can see just one of the metrics here and we were looking exclusively at indoor environmental quality but you can start to see these indicators, which you know obviously have connections to academic performance, are manifest in the modernized buildings. So this helped us argue for greater funding and continued funding of the, the process. And so with that realization that the environment directly connects and affects educational outcomes, we can start to think about net zero energy not as just resource conservation and an energy goal on first and operational costs, but a direct connection to uh, educational outcomes. So hopefully you'll see this in the projects that I'll share. The first is John Lewis Elementary, just opened a few weeks ago. Uh, so I don't have you know, all the photography yet. Uh, you'll see a lot of renderings. Um, but again, the first net zero and well certified targeted uh, project in the District of Columbia. It started you know, with this building, though, uh, that they'd occupied since the 70s, a brutalist open plan building. This is actually its best facade, uh, so much 
much like uh, Dr. France was talking about. But in the lower left, you see something that's really important. Um, just weeks before we were hired, they actually uh, brought uh, the artist Mas Paz you know, to the campus to try and animate the architecture. And we were shocked by this. I, uh, it's beautiful and lovely, and you know, but we were slated to demolish the building. You know, fortunately, Mas Paz was, you know, he knew about that, he was cool with that, um, and we could bring him on, as you'll see in a moment, you know, to help us create a new architecture. But a lot of what we are, we're doing is building upon that research base, so evaluating CO2 and acoustical performance in that existing environment, daylight, all of which, you know, the building was failing upon, and you can imagine, again, that drag on education you know, that that building was. And so we set performance-based goals going ahead. Um, so moving away from anecdote and design-based goals you know, to things that are demonstrably and, and measurable uh, to really prove that we were achieving what we were trying to do. Again, demonstrating to the city council, city administrator, all the way to the mayor that the modernization program is having the impact they expect. So zero energy, well certification, of course, being on budget, and then this idea of net positive education through pre and post occupancy evaluation, proving you know, that we were uh, delivering what we had promised. So the project starts, of course, with a site analysis, um, dealing with context and arrival. And this is a two-sided campus and you know, thinking very uh, actively about the path of the sun across the site. And we had received a feasibility study. Um, and the feasibility study actually had the building oriented north-south, you know, so sort of a, a, a almost instantaneous change that we made is flipping it 90 degrees to you know, deal with the solar orientation of the property so we can deal with great daylight in the building and reduce the, the operational costs at the same time. And just an illustration of what that cost might be in that simple change, no cost of, in, associated with it to do it, but you can see that 10% of the energy consumption was saved you know, from that orientation swap from the building. Educationally, um, much like uh, Dr. France was saying, you know, the, this open plan building, you know, it had its problems acoustically and otherwise, but it had a great sense of community and communication in there. So we wanted to create classrooms that had this operable threshold uh, so that you could open and close them to the community commons and create, you know, within each house uh, a different dynamic, you know, from moment to moment as you're learning. And this is what that, you know, uh, community commons looks like today and so you see the rolling partitions and the sense of transparency and then uh, you know and you know that operable threshold that teachers and students can control as we go the outside is equally rich as the interior though um, and the campus creates you know from the amphitheater on the left to the early childhood courtyard in the center to the older childhood play areas uh, to the right of a diversity of spaces that are developmentally appropriate challenging and interesting to be in they are just some uh, photos hot off the press here uh, as the building opened but then also thinking about high performance again and daylight. This was our first section through the building. So of course we're bringing daylight in from the north and south facades, but also keeping the building at two stories and bringing daylight in from above was a key driver for us. Um, and studying again, the radiation on the facade so that again, we are actively uh, modeling and generating and predicting the performance of this building from the daylight in the classroom from the original model and then all through the iterations as we created a, a, a great day lit classroom for every environment throughout. And so this is what they, they look like. Uh, and you know, this is a 25% window to wall ratio. So if you think that's modest, uh, actually it's quite generous and, and beautiful and, and wonderfully day lit. And then finally, again, thinking about that first experience of walking into the building, this is what you arrive into, an open plan library. Um, and you see the new Mas Paz uh, uh, mural off to the left. So again, celebrating the culture of the community, um, but then you know, making it fun and exciting in the maker space up in a tree house, for example, and you know, creating that great place that excites the children as they walk into the environment. The second project I'm going to share with you today was designed concurrently and just opened as well. So Banneker Academic High School. Um, the important part of this in many ways is that the students drove the process. You can't hear this, but these are students marching on City Hall and 
So, and these are those students uh, in front of the mayor. And this project almost didn't happen except for these students advocating and becoming civic leaders you know, unto themselves. And this is why we do these schools, right? Is to create you know, great citizens of our communities and here they are. So advocating for their project. And it's important to note that in many ways, you know, even uh, you know, the diversity of the student body, but then these are all young women in the front row addressing you know the mayor as well so she's acknowledging their presence and and recognizing their demand for a better school environment so this school is one of the highest performing schools certainly in the city and and the country uh, but it's also a school that serves a population that uh, is in many cases the first to aspire to go to college and they graduate 100 percent of their students and 100 percent get accepted to college so it's a place of great aspiration, but also great challenge and, and at times stress. So again, we've looked at the existing conditions, benchmarked them, recognized the site that it belongs. You know, Benjamin Banneker was the surveyor of uh, Washington, D.C. on the L'Enfant plan. So this is the first time the school's actually been within his plan. So celebrating that idea, bringing the the building to a complicated site, orienting it properly, allowing for easy access to the metro, taking advantage of the park that's on the west side of 10th Street and rebuilding that park as part of our project too. So again, uh, creating a great environment, but uh, thinking about again, how do you create an exciting and dynamic environment to these college bound students? That's a transitional environment. They had modernized their learning commons or library in their existing building to create this dynamic collaborative, active place. And when we met in that place with the students, uh, we said, why isn't the whole building like this? So that was the big idea, um, is the whole building is the learning commons. You can see a terracing through the, the atrium here from top to bottom, culminating in what we call Sky Place with that great view of the Washington Monument, again, celebrating Benjamin Banneker's connection to the city. So Here's what it looked like actually in the first few weeks of the project, creating that learning commons and trying to allow for this great spill of space, you know, out uh, each level into these active and dynamic places, uh, you know, available to the students throughout the day. There's the mayor with the students again. And here's what it looks like uh, as of a few days ago. So the front facades changed a bit, but the, the, the learning commons is now, you know, again, full of students and activity as we go forward. So with that, and you know, just a few uh, photographs of some of the environments within here, the transparency and connectivity to the community and response to the community, the terracing of the learning commons to, through each level and what it looks like on a daily basis. And uh, again, as a net zero project, proving what we uh, had set out to do, even with the high performance facade. And then finally, the front door as we go as well. So with that, I'll turn it back to my colleague, uh, Pam. Almost seamless, right? <laughs> so um, I have um, a confession to make. Uh, you know, Sean, you talked about growing up in Long Island. Well, me born in a different island. I was born on St. Croix in the Virgin Islands and grew up in the Caribbean. And so when the opportunity to be involved in the Virgin Islands uh, master plan after the um, disastrous um, hurricanes of uh, Irma Maria in 2017, it was an opportunity that I just could not pass up. The other thing that is particularly fascinating about the master plan and the work in the Virgin Islands is the Bipartisan Budget Act, uh, which was passed by Congress, um, basically changed the rules and said that FEMA would uh, provide funding for industry standards. Typically, FEMA provides funding for pre-existing conditions. So you can well imagine um, the conversations with federal authorities about what are 
industry standards. So that's a whole different conversation, which I actually think is quite relevant with some of the conversations today with the CARES and ARP Act, but we will, we will leave it at that. You can see some of the uh, schools, 25 schools in the Virgin Islands, about 10,000 students. These are actually some of the schools in the best condition. Uh, the upper kind of middle yellow buildings, there is actually a modular village that was built uh, after the hurricanes, um, but fairly traditional uh, concrete block buildings that were actually built with deep sand that causes issues with uh, eroding of rebar from the inside out. And then with the recent addition of air conditioning, these buildings are not insulated. Um, and so the cold air condenses on the walls um, and creates mold. So while um, having completed uh, a lot of net positive projects in Phoenix uh, area, we thought we really knew what we were all about, but hot and dry is very different from hot and wet. But before I get started, I want to have you hear a couple words. They're looking at how do we really change the brand? How do we really produce the type of education that sets the bar? And I see us in the VI as setting the bar. And I see this work really expanding throughout the Caribbean. And so, you know, it's a humbling experience for the Department of Education. And I'm just looking forward to it expanding throughout the world. So that was Dr. Wells Hedrington. She was superintendent of St. Thomas and St. John, and she has stepped into the position as COO and is handling the conversations with FEMA and funding the master plan and the rebuild of, uh, if you will, the schools in the Virgin Islands. It will be transformational. It will be aspirational. You can see here are some of the goals from uh, the Bureau of Economic Development that are really in conjunction with, uh, if you will, the VI master plan. Um, and so goals like being 75% renewable by 2040 are certainly aspirational. The highest quality of education systems and being really the blue center of maritime type, um, if you will, uh, research and uh, work uh, uh, force development. Here are some of the IDE's goals that were set in place, and certainly front and center is the discussion of equity, including workforce development, and how these um, transformed schools, both uh, about half of them new, about half of them modernized, will in fact create the socioeconomic development for the entire Virgin Islands. Here are some of the pathways that are really driven by the um, uh, GDP in the Virgin Islands. Um, you know, who knew that the Virgin Islands is the epicenter of IT connections throughout the Caribbean and um, South America? You know, who knew the appetite for sports tourism uh, and uh, events that could be sponsored in the Virgin Islands? Um, you know, certainly the conversation of hospitality and tourism. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have been in the Virgin Islands recently, but it's almost impossible to find some place to stay because it's part of the US and everyone wants to go there. So I'm going to sh show you two quick snippets, one of Charlotte Omley High School and one of a pre-K 12 on St. John. Um, one of the things that was really integral to these designs is that the, the Virgin Islanders are very proud of their heritage and history. And so um, Charlotte Omley High School is really of St. Thomas, uh, the red roots of Charlotte Omley, the vernacular architecture that is derivative of the history of the Danish and actually living under seven flags. The other thing that is really interesting that I'll talk about as we go through these projects is the conversation of the requirement for air conditioning and how do you zone um, places and spaces that allow to celebrate the outdoor environment, but still uh, provide those semi-conditioned spaces and then the thermal barriers that prevent um, uh, mold and migration. One of the big things that was a conversation of um, Charlotte Omley High School, the home of the famous chicken hawks, is how do you bring everyone together at that central spine, um, which we uh, nicknamed the carnival because the carnival is where everything happens and that this becomes a place and space even with a steep slope that allows um, all of the students to interact together. Um, on the left, you can see uh, are the uh, learning uh, environments uh, with small learning uh, communities. 
uh, with the uh, more public spaces on the, on the right. Here is a view, um, if you will, from the upper part of the campus. We've flipped, uh, if you will, the entrance to up the hill as opposed to off the road, road down below to reduce some of those circulation issues and also provide an amazing view of Charlotte Only um, Harbor. All of the designs were really based on components, building components that could be prototyped, if you will, as a componentized system for the high schools and the K through eights that are being designed. Um, this site is relative, relatively, is very sloped, and you can see the uh, relationship of the, the three, um, if you will, academic buildings with the lower grades on the upper part of the hill, the upper grades on the lower part of the hill, and then that mixing box that really is the applied learning CTE courses in the center. Um, you can see with a diagonal that is connected at multiple levels, um, I, it really was about creating this sense of community that is lacking with the separation between the existing buildings that were built in the 60s uh, and are in very poor condition. In fact, um, three of them have been condemned. So um, here's a couple views of the outside, a couple views of the inside that show that those open collaboration spaces that we all know um, allow for individual learning to take place not just within the classroom, but also in breakout spaces. And I am going to now show you a very quick, whoops, um, a very quick video that gives you a more three-dimensional uh, feel for the overall uh, campus at Charlotte and Molly. You can see here, this is the view from down below um, and with uh, ADA access, uh, through uh, ramps that slope up and uh, traverse the site so that all of the spaces and places are ADA accessible. This is not a common uh, element within the Virgin Islands right now, but has to be part of that conversation of equity. You can see the sports and the sports arena that overlooks the fields. And now we are zooming in from up above the campus and with the academic buildings to the right and the public space is the library on the left. As we move down the hill, we're moving into the marketplace or dining commons, which will host some of the classrooms and learning experiences for hospitality and tourism. Lots of sun and shade. Buildings are oriented for um, the trade winds um, and if you will, the buildings self-shading each other. Uh, while the environment in the Virgin Islands is quite fantastic, it can be um, a little hot and a little muggy, uh, if not appropriately shaded. Uh, certainly as a child growing up, I remember that sense of relief when you walked in from the shade, especially if you're barefoot <laughs> um, and feeling that cool tile as you walk in. We're now zooming over to the more public spaces, uh, if you will, the library and the performing arts. Uh, within the Virgin Islands, biggest, big focus is in dance and music. Uh, between Quelby, which is a combination of fife and drum and calypso. Um, it certainly is a rich, rich palette on which to focus some of the performing arts, some of the graphics, some of the other pathways that can be combined with that kind of uh, pathway of fashion. If we then move to um, the pre-K-12 on St. John, this is a facility for about 450 students. Um, we had um, thought that the Charlotte Only High School site was steep, nothing like Sprow. So this um, steps up about uh, 500 feet up the site uh, with the administration, the gym, the learning commons at the lower levels, and then the academic pathways um, K through 12 up above. The concept was really based on how it steps up on the hill and the fact that the lower level is considered the grotto. Um, which is where our cisterns and uh, mechanical systems um, are located. This building is located in a national park. It is off the grid. Um, it has cistern water, septics, and um, solar panels. The mid layer or understory is where the specialty courses, um, CTE, applied learning, et cetera, are located. And there is a um, site access at the upper part that allows easy access to those CTE spaces. And then the upper level or uh, 
altana or canopy, which is in the trees, is really where all of the learning suites are located. You can see in terms of these plans, sorry, I'm talking so fast. Sean and I have a lot to cover, right? Um, you can see on these plans, uh, the, uh, if you will, outdoor areas, um, how they intersect with the indoor areas that are conditioned uh, in order to provide, if you will, that, that tempered space. Um, even, though, um, even though calculations show that they could, they could maintain temperatures below 84 degrees, 99.9% .9 of the time, certainly the current culture uh, really um, links air conditioning with um, thermal comfort. So one has to always think about the culture and context in which one is working. So you can see in terms of the overall um, renderings, and we'll do a quick fly through. Uh, St. John is a volcanic island. Um, it's interesting when you do the sun uh, studies. Uh, this is actually a gray building, but it turns quite bright uh, in the bright uh, sunlight of the Caribbean. So uh, this is the commons area. It really also celebrates the arts. St. John has a very, very strong arts community. So this school provides not only um, sustenance to the students of St. John, which, um, but also to the overall community of St. John. Um, here is uh, the, uh, one of the breakout spaces uh, in the library that really allows for um, those casual collisions to happen. So for a quick, uh, video, you can see um, this is probably a little bit more color specific <laughs> representing the volcanic rock. Same conversation of how do you make a campus like this ADA accessible. Um, and um, certainly uh, our engineers were um, challenged in really making this off grid building, which I think is um, pretty, pretty unusual. Uh, and as Dr. Wells Hedrington said, this will um, make the Virgin Islands a special place in the world. Uh, certainly the discussion of landscaping um, and how you put back the natural environment. Um, you can see the openness of um, movable um, glass walls and shelters uh, that uh, provide those kinds of connections. I should also add both at Charlotte Omley and um, at Sproul, uh, the gymnasiums are FEMA shelters. And if you've ever tried to design an attractive FEMA shelter that complies with IBC 2021, you know, we should share stories. You can see a lot of the structure that is hung from the roof is actually keeping the roof from flying off uh, with hurricane force winds. Um, 2021 actually is the first code that in includes special wind resistance areas. But the important thing is really the kids and how did we provide a, an environment that was really scaled and particular to St. John. All three of the islands in the Virgin Islands are very, very different. And so that culture and context was always something that was kept uh, uppermost in, in everyone's mind. I have to admit that I perhaps I had forgotten how important culture and context is um, in every single school, in every single district. Everyone has a very unique learning signature and that, as I was saying at the beginning, is really the North Star that all of our buildings should be designed to. You can see beyond the school is some ruins from the original sugar plantation that was on St. John. Um, these are protected by the USBI. And so how can that become an outdoor learning place uh, that allows students to really uh, understand, if you will, their history and heritage, um, both the good and the bad. The upper level, which is the K through 12 facilities, you can, as you peek through this first room, you can almost see the road that is the access for CTE. Um, they are really looking at major uh, focuses in terms of echo development and in terms of maritime, both um, boats and or scientific research real related to, uh, if you will, the, the maritime environment and coral and so on and so on. Um, so very quickly, um, that is Sprout K through 12.
So one last closing note. Um, certainly when you look at CTE and applied learning, if you will, in the 16 pathways that are um, part of the national conversation, every school has a unique take in terms of their curriculum, in terms of their industry partners, in terms of how it's incorporated into their very fabric. And so that is um, uh, a robust conversation, I hope, will occur after Sean presents his two schools that are on the boards. Sean. Thanks, Pam. Uh, impressive again, and uh, nice to take us to the islands there. Um, I'm gonna take us back to Washington, um, but the other side of the city. Um, and so to Pam's point, you know, every, every school is, is different. Every culture within the school is different. And you know, that's certainly true here in the District of Columbia where, uh, you know, the, you know, the culture dynamics, you know, between a school in one neighborhood and the next, uh, you know, can be very, very different. The context can be different. The issues can be different. Um, and this is a, a Another very different program that is new to the District of Columbia, Bard High School Early College Program. This is part of a network of schools actually, you know, created by Bard College in New York. Um, and many of them uh, started in uh, New York City. So there's several campuses in New York City. There's one in Baltimore. This uh, is the first instance here in Washington. And it's also the first opportunity that they've had to sort of purpose built uh, an environment for themselves. So, you know, in many ways, it's the, I think, becoming the vanguard of what their environments might be like versus, you know, some of the buildings that they've inherited. Uh, just again, some context, you know, from the city, you see the Washington Monument off to the left. We're on the other side of the Anacostia River now in uh, Ward 8. Um, and so, you know, uh, a very different context than the buildings that I showed you before, but again, you know, an integral part of the, the fabric of our city. Um, and the site was an interesting one. It was a decommissioned open plan brutalist elementary school. Sounds familiar, right? Um, but some interesting dynamics happened here that uh, changed the, the game for us in some ways. One, uh, because of the affordable housing crisis and housing insecurity here in the city and the mayor's mission to address that issue, they took a portion of the site and, and allocated it to another agency for affordable housing. So, you know, the site, while not big uh, to begin with, started to get smaller. Um, and you can also see the unusual shape and the metro tunnel that runs beneath the site also becoming a constraint. But a real opportunity, though, as this uh, school, like uh, Banneker, uh, attract students from across the city. So having Metro right adjacent to the site, uh, the subway system by other names uh, was a really powerful and important uh, aspect of the site selection here. So this is the existing building decommissioned a number of years ago, used by the community only sporadically for some events in the sort of multi-purpose room, but an open plan building, uh, not the most lovely environment that you could imagine, um, and a deep building because of the open plan uh, of its original design. You can see the sort of cores in the diagram on the left, but you know, really a big open flexible space. Um, then when you overlaid the structure within there, you started to realize that you know this is actually a pretty pretty interesting and uh, flexible floor plate for us to start to think about creating a, a new environment as we transitioned it from elementary school to secondary school, but then also recognizing that the, the interior of the floor plate has certain daylighting challenges uh, as well. So our first, you know, gestures at a concept for this certainly started to think about, you know, transforming the, the very heart of this building and creating something that, you know, truly felt like a college building more so than a secondary school in many ways, because these students, they finish their high school program in the first two years, the second two years of their tenure here is, is when they're working on an associate's degree. So a really incredible opportunity to become the uh, higher education environment, you know, rather than serve as a transitional environment in one of ways here as well. And this was a video that we created early on. You'll see that the architecture has changed, but um, the idea again of, you know, transforming the civic presence of this building, creating a marquee for a bard, you know, in this environment, but then creating something again, that felt like you were walking into a great school on a 
even Bard's campus, you know, one of the great liberal arts campuses uh, in many ways, and connecting all the levels, you know, while retaining the integrity of the high school program versus the early college program here, and then, you know, looking for ways again to bring natural light, you know, into this deep uh, and dark center of the building. So, as we pursued all those goals of high performance as well. Uh, of course, this facade was not high performance uh, and in many ways, you know, couldn't even meet the energy code today. So we uh, stripped it off, stripped the building down to structure. So you can do this stuff with existing buildings of certain generations um, and create, you know, again, a new civic presence for the building, create that high performance environment that conserves energy and resources and creates that high performance learning environment. So here you see the the new front door, the new sort of civic presence on the building, the administration down below. Um, and uh, then what we also had to do though, recognizing the challenges of this uh, particular building, this is the existing piece. There was a one story multi-purpose room here and it didn't have the clearance for a, a high school gym. So we took it down um, and created uh, a new volume here that also, again, started to manifest the presence of BARD in the community here. Um, again, recognizing a lot of people are coming from the Metro and then see this building and this facade, um, but also give us the spaces that the existing building could do. This is the community entrance for use after hours. And here's the plan. I won't belabor the plan too much, but you can see the cores that were here. Um, and then the, the access to natural light from the perimeter for open spaces that feel collegiate like the cafe I'll show you in a moment. And then you'll see that the that heart of the school actually has a black box in it now, uh, you know, it's as we tried to make sure that they had every aspect of their program. So this is the new scholars uh, 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 Socratic walk, uh, as we call it here, uh, you know, which spirals up through the building, connecting all levels. Here's that black box, a flexible space that opens into the heart of the school. You see the cafe beyond, which is this. Uh, again, you know, a, a collegiate ambiance, uh, you know, an open and uh, dynamic and flexible quality to the spaces. You know, taking advantage of again that footprint, and then as we rise through the building through the Socratic walk, arriving into the library where the students told us, you know, is true truly the heart of the school. So creating again, uh, open and flexible and dynamic space where you can flow in and out you know, from all of the adjacent instructional spaces here as well. And then finally, um, I lied a little bit. I'm gonna take you across the river to Alexandria here. Um, so, uh, you know, it's striking distance to the District of Columbia, but many of the themes are the same uh, to the new Alexandria City High School. This is a school that used to be called T.C. Williams. If you uh, move, or if you're a movie buff and you watch Remember the Titans, this is the high school that they're talking about. So issues of equity and, and race and you know are very manifest in their commitment to diversity and equity, you know, in this project. But that drove a couple of decisions as the campus, the existing high school, the only one in town, um, is growing towards 5,000 students. They had a big decision to make. Do we create another high school or do we create an, a constellation of resources across the uh, city that becomes a singular high school, which is the option they voted for. So you see the existing campus called King Street here. Um, our campus called New Steam Center, which uh, it's ex actually expanded its scope there involving a lot of the CTE programs Pam was talking about and other uh, you know, partnerships you know, as you start to see here, but an early college program elsewhere, satellite campuses uh, as well. So a constellation of resources in many ways becoming a true campus that for the students. So here's the two sites, you know, our site and the existing high school. So also thinking about, you know, how we create a, a continuity and a, a pleasurable connection between something that right now is very automotive and in many ways dangerous, you know, to traverse. And think about, again, those higher order goals of extending the campus, creating a first impression, you know, creating those interdisciplinary environments, pursuing net zero energy, and folding in those CTE programs in many ways that realize the superintendent's goal to create a, and a really engaging and and exciting student experience, you know, through more active and experiential learning environments. So. To do that, um, we started to think again about the scale of the environment and scaling it down and scaling it up to create, you know, 
hierarchy through the community. So neighborhoods of classrooms and other resources, shared spaces like the sciences and the arts and the steam oriented sort of arrangement, but then taking the dining and distributing it across the building so that it's not this singular institutional space that it actually becomes the extended learning space that is the glue on every level of the building now called the creative commons. And here's some diagrams from that EdSpec starting to look at that creative commons. So arts and sciences and CTE programs all having the opportunity to take control of that former dining space now as the creative commons. We redid their schedule so that there's only a single community lunch in the middle of the day. Everybody eats at the same time. So this space will be full of kids you know, for lunch, but then the classrooms can all grab onto it you know, in every other block of the day. Uh, and the neighborhoods that you'll see within each of the wings, you know, again, interdisciplinary neighborhoods organized around extended learning spaces to provide a great and dynamic flow in and out of each of the classrooms or operable partitions to open classrooms, teacher workspace, and a two-story learning stair connecting even these uh, neighborhoods vertically throughout. So here's the site. It's compact again, and a lot of it is public open space. So used as a park by Parks and Rec, but you can see the facilities, uh, you know, including a pool. Um, this is in many ways a community school as well. So there's an early childhood center, there's a teen wellness center, there's uh, community counseling available in the building too. So it's not just a high school, it's a total uh, community resource to enhance uh, student achievement in many ways. So the massing is, is trying to break down the five-story building in many ways uh, and allow it to cascade down the topography you'll see. We've got 60 feet of change, not 500 perhaps, but uh, across our site, but still a lot for an urban building. And here you see uh, you know, just a walk you know, through the building. You look up the hill here, that's 60 feet up. Uh, so dealing with that in many ways and integrating the building became a real opportunity. But this is called Scholars Green, the quadrangle at the entrance of the building to allow students to decompress or uh, education to spill out on this tight urban site. Braddock Road is quite busy off to the left. So again, giving uh, a little breathing room between the building. Walking up to the front door, um, you see again, this is a net zero project. So PVs on the facade, um, there's an energy uh, pathway within the CTE program. So again, the building as a teaching tool is a real opportunity. That's the early childhood center off to the left. That's actually a playground now to the left into the building um, you know, through all the sort of safety and security protocols that uh, we all know so well, but still maintaining an inviting aspect. You'll forgive us on the finishes, you know, we're not uh, there yet. This is again, uh, work on the boards, but you walk in and you're in the heart of the school, the Creative Commons, and here's a CTE program. They're not back around near the loading dock any longer. You know, they are here to take control of this space. This is the first level Creative Commons and the learning stair up to the second entrance, uh, you know, from the level above that we're about to walk to uh, as well. You see the photovoltaics on the site shading the, the bleachers and uh, uh, the fields uh, as well, and the different terracing of the site as we uh, address uh, the topography on the left. And this is the bus oriented uh, arrival here, separating traffic. Pool to the left, uh, public amenity operated by the, the parks department. And now we're back into the Creative Commons on the second level, and you see the one on the third, and there's the fourth and the fifth uh, as well. So every uh, level of the building has that same sort of social infrastructure, including the distributed administration that you see uh, in the distance here, distributed throughout for engagement with the students, more CTE programs uh, front and center, uh, you know, and op operable partitions allowing it to spill out and control that Creative Commons as we go. And then the final touch is remembering again that, you know, this is a community facility. This is the public open space. You know, so there's walking trails and other amenities for, for the community to actively use the outdoor space as well. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to uh, Tony, I think. Yeah. So Sean, I need, I need to, I was thinking while you were talking and not so long ago, maybe 35 years ago, at New Jersey Institute of Technology with Dean Evans and Ezra, and you were there and I was there, and we were talking about the future of teaching and learning. 
And it is amazing, despite the frustrations we face on a day-to-day -day basis, truly how far we've come. So, you know, it's, um, it's the challenges are there, but the opportunities are even greater. Yeah, agreed. It's exciting to see all the different opportunities and a lot of the synergies and exciting places that uh, we've both just shared. So, uh, you know, really proud of the work and as I'm sure you are as well. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pam and Sean, for those presentations. Beautiful projects and very inspiring spaces. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm looking at some of them. Pam already uh, responded. Thank you so much because we don't have too much time anymore. Uh, but I think I'm going to go through one that I think it was more uh, towards Sean. Uh, Moes had a question about uh, the District of, of Columbia with the bipartisan political environment in the District of Columbia. What challenges do you have in terms of public funding and award of design contracts for new schools? Um, well, the federal government is one thing uh, and the local government's another. Um, yeah, so uh, this is uh, a democratic city in many ways uh, and the mayor is Democrat as so are many of the city council. Uh, so there, you won't, don't find the sort of uh, uh, partisan infighting you know, that you do within the federal government here. Um, so it's not so much an issue. And again, uh, in many ways, um, if you were following uh, the prior administration, I mean, the Black Lives Matter Plaza was created here you know, by the mayor in front of the White House, uh, continues to exist today. Um, so again, she and her administration are very forward thinking on uh, addressing many of the, the social issues you know, that we've been confronting and, uh, and they've put forth an agenda uh, to, to address those, uh, which I think has bipartisan and unanimous support. Um, and funding um, is actually through the study that uh, we did um, that about the performance of the schools that's been attached to the budget requests of the last two DCPS uh, submissions. So again, uh, you know, funding has actually increased uh, for both schools and uh, operation and capital over the past few years uh, because recognition of the the and demonstration of the actual performance and, and delivery and value of, of the work. So it yeah. uh, so, hasn't been an issue. Yeah, so Graciela, I think it's, it's an interesting point in time because when you, when you look at, if you will, the CARES, the ARP Act, um, some, of the, some of the conversations that are happening federally to address funding across the United States and its territories, it is an interesting conversation because even though it starts to include billions of dollars, it really represents, I think it's six to 8% of the overall cost of construction and planning uh, across the country. And I think that it is a bipartisan conversation about how important schools and equity across the country is. Um, and so I would encourage everyone to get involved. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mary Florido and a 21st century organization and the basic coalition that she's put together a lot, a lot of advocacy related to, if you will, the conversation of making sure that schools and funding is not just for solving deficiencies, but actually providing modernized schools that really address the changing shifts in um, uh, kind of meeting students where they are, of changing curriculum, of industry partners and all those things that are fundamentally changing the face of architecture that enables. Thank you, Pam and Sean. We have another question uh, regarding soft skills. How do you measure them? And because I think you were, I think Sean was mentioning something about that. Um, how, do, how do you measure the soft skills demonstrated by engagement? in high performance learning? Um, it's, it's a good question. I'm not sure that I, I totally understand it, um, but uh, yeah, the 
the research that we're doing here with the district, you know, started with IEQ. So we were focused on you know, certain uh, attributes and indicators of the environment, but we've now expanded through the Latrobe Prize uh, to uh, address, you know, issues of educational adequacy and community connectivity. Um, and so perhaps, you know, between those latter two buckets, you know, is where you'll find the soft skills you know, and both uh, the facets of the built environment that will support, you know, student success, you know, through uh, engagement with, again, those community school resources uh, and uh, other factors of the environment and services being provided in these environments. Um, so the, um, you know, again, I'm not quite sure, you know, Lenny, what your question is, is targeted at, but maybe you can jump in and then clarify it uh, as well. So. So I can also add, I can tell you at Cherry Creek, so 30% of the students' grades for the uh, courses that they take at the Innovation Campus includes, uh, if you will, soft skills. And so they have a very, very specific rubric uh, that is used for their scoring, uh, be it their, uh, you know, their civic engagement in uh, classes outside, their um, you know, uh, responsiveness to industry partners, uh, and so on and so on. Um, I can certainly, if, some, if people are interested, I, I can get a, a copy of that rubric from Cherry Creek and, and share it with others. So now, Graciela, yeah, Graciela I think there were some questions also in the chat. I don't know if you saw them. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm going through the chat now. Okay. Uh, that uh, Bruce has a question regarding from your own experience designing uh, schools if there are a certain percentage of classrooms still being built as standard box spaces, are most new classroom flexible, changeable? Yeah, I think we're creating a, you know, again, a, a constellation of opportunities for learning to happen in a variety of different spaces. Um, so, and that circumstance changes with the, the culture of the school, you know, in many ways. But you know, the idea of flexibility, uh, you know, and transparency, you know, whether, and uh, operability, you know, in many ways uh, to engage uh, diversity of spaces from small, medium, large, you know, through the the learning environment, so that. We We've got things that are uh, appropriate and tailored and, and differentiated in some ways, uh, you know, I think is in many ways the goals of what we're talking about. And uh, you know, uh, those vary, as you can see, once you get into a very different climate like the Virgin Islands or we're working in Guatemala, for example, where you know, the outdoors is just as active and engaged uh, you know, in, uh, as an educational setting as you know, any of the sort of uh, you know, classrooms or whatever you'd like to call them might be as well. So it's more dynamic, more diverse. And I think coming out of the pandemic, we're going to see even more of that uh, because of the way we're using the environment uh, and particularly the outdoors right now. So, uh, you know, so I think if anything, it's going to get more diverse, more interesting you know, as, as we go uh, and, and collect our thoughts you know, based on our experience over the last two years. Um, do you have anything? Oh, I was trying not to not to do tip for tat for each one of our answers. <laughs> Great answer, Sean. <laughs> I have one for you, Pam. Uh, Greg O'Connor, he realized that you mentioned that concrete block with the AC creates moldy walls. What type of wall construction are you using in these projects in the Virgin Islands? Um, so we are still using a lot of block. Um, but we are providing thermal envelopes on the outside. Uh, so, you know, all of us that went to architecture school remember those psychometric charts and everything else, they actually do work. Um, and so all, as I said, there is a thermal barrier with insulation, um, everything else breaks at the window um, to provide that, that continuity of surface. Um, and then there was a lot of study of how do you go from the outdoor to semi-climatized, i.e. still outdoor spaces, to the indoor spaces. The other thing that is interesting is um, the Virgin Islands is in uh, the highest seismic zone possible. It's as an active an area as California. And so um, when you think about 
buildings rocking and rolling because of earthquakes. You really want to reduce, if you will, the, the mass at the upper levels. So as we go to some of the upper levels, um, those um, walls are starting to be um, you know, light gauge steel. Uh, because, oh, what about the termites? <laughs> so I've got to say, in terms of really all the complexities and all of the requirements that are now in IBC 2021, very, very compl complex three-dimensional um, designs for, for all of the schools, um, particularly in a building environment that is pretty expensive because you're shipping in labor and goods. And so... Um, I'm telling you, for those of you who haven't worked with IBC 2021, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful, but quite complex. And I think we still have time for one more question. Uh, we have one in the Q&A. Are you seeing a shift in education towards pathways, which is moving education towards meeting job market demands rather than education for education purposes? So maybe I can start with that. I've got to say that, you know, the number one thing we've learned, um, you know, certainly from the student engagement and, and teacher engagement index that we, uh, you know, was first started with Lonnie Scott Weber and then is continued to be developed with DLR group is if students are engaged, outcomes are improved. And when you think about it, if you can take theoretical learning and put it in a context that really resonates with, with kids, it really makes it authentic and scalable. And so I think it's not so much one or the other, it's when you weave those two, weave those two approaches together, of course you need to understand the theoretical side of algebra and physics and whatever. I mean, interestingly enough, at Canyon View, they switched so freshmen take physics. So that's one example because they felt, Philip Nolan, the principal, felt that it was a better tie to algebra and ninth graders really wanting hands-on type activities. So we're learning how to better engage students, both from a teacher's level, you know, from a curriculum level, from an aspirational level. And so we have the tools to really improve those connections and provide facilities that are places and spaces that teachers and students want to be at. I mean, the first goal is students have to want to be there. Dr. France, you started with a conversation of who wanted to be in that school, right? That's, that's a pretty low bar. You know, and we as part of the AEC community have to really, really, really embrace that. And we have to be sure that we're making arguments, be it with Congress, be it with local constituents, that dollars invested create social economic opportunities that are incredible return on investments. And I think uh, it caught my attention, uh, an answer that you had to one of the questions. The question was that when you were presenting the school in the park environment, what was the animal population in the park? And if it was a threat to the students and you answered that the biggest issues were iguanas. <laughs> Not was really a threat, but disruptive. <laughs> So you had to actually consider all the different species and, and actually work with the design on that, I guess. There, there, were, there was a lot of talk about iguanas now. Um, I guess the population has really grown um, because I remember when I lived down on the islands, there were a couple of iguanas and they were much revered. <laughs> so um, it, it, it was an interesting conversation, but one that had to be um, addressed specifically because the iguanas really love water. So how do you make sure that the cisterns are enclosed so the iguanas aren't diving into the cisterns and they're not able to get out because that's bad. <laughs> I so. see now that conversation. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, thank you so much, Sean and Pamela. Uh, we have two minutes if anybody else wants to send a question. We had a ton of them. We are going to have a recording of this session on the YouTube channel of the chapter, also the, the chapter's websites and NASA BOSIS website uh, in case you want to share with other peers. I think this was great. Thank you so much, Sean and Pamela. Tony, would you like to say sure. some closing remarks? Sure. Um, so before we sign off, again, a, a very special thank you to our speakers, uh, Pamela Leffelman from the DLR group uh, and Sean O'Donnell from uh, Perkins Eastman. 
um, excellent and very informative presentations. You both gave us some uh, really creative case studies and some great examples of innovative school designs and, and plenty to think about. So thank you both uh, very much for some great presentations. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our NASA BOCES Associate Superintendent, Dr. R.G. France for her very relevant and very inspiring opening remarks, as well as our NASA BOCES board for their strong support in this initiative. Uh, I wanna thank everyone at AAA Long Island and Graciela Carrillo for all of their hard work and uh, the hard work they did and, pro uh, and they provided in, in all of the webinar planning. So thank you very much. Thank you to AIA in New York State, as well as our sponsors who helped make this event possible. Um, also, Nicole O'Donnell, our sign interpreter, who always does a great job for us. Thank you very much. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank all of you in our audience for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in today's webinar. Uh, you are the stakeholders in education, and all of you play such a critical role in driving this important conversation. So with that, uh, we'd like to invite all of you back for our third and final segment of this webinar series. It's scheduled uh, two weeks from today, October 27th, from 10 o'clock a.m. to 11.30 a.m., and that's Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll be featuring school uh, projects from Urban 3 and Atelier BNK, and they're two uh, leading architectural firms from Germany and Japan. So uh, we look forward to that. So please mark your calendars and uh, thanks again to all of you and be well. So take care, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you. Have Thank a you. good day. Hope to see you soon, Pam and Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs>